All right, and this question comes from Moose Man, and he says, Steve. Hi, Moose Man. Not as poorly, unfortunately. Oh, no worries. Uh, learning about co complexes, I've considered <coughs> that other people can see complexes ingrained within an individual's persona. I personally have not developed how to see complexes so keenly. What has caused your development in spotting complexes? Ooh, um, I think a forensic attitude of mind uh, mixed with a scientific one. If you put those two together, they kind of amplify one another very efficiently, and... Observation is absolutely everything. Um, knowing what to look for, not being put off by somebody's persona, that's really important. Uh, all the time looking behind that because personas are usually crafted um, at least to the point where they can distract you. That is their intention. It's, they're supposed really to reduce social tension between people so they can get on with a conversation. So if you just look at the persona, you're not really going to pick them up. You need to attend at all times to what's going on in the background and most people give them away actually verbally which is perhaps not what they would expect um, but complexes can slip in in the middle of a conversation and literally cut and paste themselves in and then you see there's a pattern emerging so that's one of the best ways is to actually listen to what people say properly and not to be distracted visually by how they present or any other accoutrements of their persona, including the way that they dress, their manner of walking, but what they say will pick up an awful lot of complexes and particularly those that they themselves are unaware of. So that would be the first thing. Definitely listen to what people say and then as you move on, uh, develop your observational powers and your capacity to parallel process by which I mean you're observing the other person and the information that you're receiving through your senses across the whole bandwidth of them, but you're also noting your own response on the inside because your unconscious will be reacting to its perceptions of them, including their complexes. And if you're aware of your own reactions simultaneously, that is to say parallel processing, with respect to your communication with another person, you can definitely pick up things quickly. So I would say that as a starting point. Hmm. It reminds me of when um, we, we first met and we started doing therapeutic things together. Yeah. I remember we'd be on the phone or whatever, or, or over Zoom, and you'd be like, oh, what's what's going on? And I'd say something, and then you'd be like, that's not what you mean, is it? Something, Some yeah. kind of nonsense would come out. One of the things I've noticed is when talking to, say, a patient, you, <laughs> when someone comes in and says, I feel like I can't be helped, or I feel like everyone else is like this, or yeah. X couldn't have really been that bad because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. Because one of the things obviously you taught me was what complexes mm -hmm. will do is they'll talk through somebody, yeah. bounce it off of you and look for confirmation. Absolutely. And then you're absolutely trapped yeah. and taken out. Yeah. It's like that's something to bear in mind as well when talking to somebody else. It's like, is it truly what they believe or is it as if they've got a sub circuit, if you like, yeah. that runs in the background yeah, spouting out nonsense. Yeah. 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 yeah, they do look for confirmation bias um, and they will set you up so you do that and you don't realise you've done it. And in that sense, it's a little bit like a submarine and it's periscope. It, you can see it emerging, if you like, metaphorically from beneath the waves, has a little peek at you, it'll size you up and then decide to throw something at you in the form of a metaphorical torpedo. And if it hits home, you will confirm that the complex is active um, and has also confirmed its belief within ego consciousness of the person who is suffering from it. And they do this all the time. They're very, very manipulative. Complexes have access to the intelligence, the memory, the emotions, the life experience of the individual sufferer. So they're just as clever, if not more so. <clears throat> so could you use the, the principle of by his or her libido, you shall know him with that? Absolutely. So, so you, you take like a so moose man, you take your friend or something, you sit down, two hours, you're having a conversation. So what, what are they going to talk about? Yeah. It's going to be directed by... You know what their libido is interested in, and then at the heart of that, presumably, will be a complex, rather than the idea of, sort yeah. of the self, where you're meant to be going yeah. in these Jungian terms. Yeah, um, you, you can pick up a person's character that way very quickly, can't you, Paul? You know, by the libido, what what it's invested in. Um, oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a very strong indicator, yeah. isn't it? Yes, it is very very much so. I mean, you, I, I guess you're probably thinking about people who have a tendency towards psychopathy and and, yeah. and even sociopathy in, and yes like, yeah. um, and uh, whilst it's an un unpleasant subject in paedophiles yes, as well indeed. because yeah. um, I mean you often use the expression about if you want to find um, you know a paedophile well you basically 
you locate children. Yeah, you, you and, do. And exactly. they, they will be somewhere in the vicinity of those children. Yeah, or, in, indeed. Yes. Yeah, yeah the phrase yeah. I, I often use, if you want to catch a lion, That's right. go and stand yes. with the zebra, they'll mm. soon turn up. And it's the same mm. with paedophiles. If you want to catch, in a forensic sense, a paedophile, it's really easy. Just go wherever the prey is. Yeah. They will turn up. They're already there. They'll be embedded into the ecology of their victims. They'll be there. Yeah. And they're... Their libido generally will flow in that direction. All of their interests are focused on the expression of that version of sexuality. Yeah. But libido isn't just sexuality, of course. No. It's, um, you'll find with artists that their libido goes into the creative process. But you can find out a lot by what they produce, what the libido drive yes. is within. Yeah. And that libido essentially is the expression of instinct and the, the drive to completion, which you were mentioning just before, James. And complexes ride on the surface of libido. They form around it, they utilize the energy. So again, with the, the idea of a paedophile, you'll find that their complexes will resolve into focus around that. In fact, the ones that we've uh, encountered were so much that way, you could, if you didn't know what they were, <coughs> You could have found that out simply in a conversation to them, even if they yes. were trying to hide it, yes. because you could see where the libido was going in terms of what their educational interests were, uh, for example, uh, even where their art was going, mm. uh, all of that. And then you'd get that surface structure impression, which is their complexes that suggest something beyond that. Then um, obviously, as you uh, find out more about them, then you get the confirmation that that's true. And so in that sense, the complexes wave the flag on the surface and say, this is where this person's libido is going. Yeah. But yeah, it, but, it, it's the kind yeah. of thing that, that most people don't see because yeah. it, it, it's so woven in seamlessly isn't yeah. it, to their sort of conversation and, and their everyday way of being that the average person wouldn't pick it up. No. It no. would just appear to be an innocuous thing. Yeah, we have we have known people. Oh, we like have, that. we have indeed. Um, yeah, and as you say, by their libido, shall you know them, and that mm. that's it. You know, mm. th this will work with anyone actually, yeah. Yeah. anybody at all. Um, it doesn't have to be in a, a malignant sense, as in no. paedophilia, but no. anybody. Well, it could even um, be something like mental health. For yeah, example, yeah. if you think about psychiatry yeah. and psychiatrists, they tend to be drawn to the profession maybe because either themselves or somebody else in, in their family or their wider context has mental health issues. Yeah. It's a similar sort of thing, but like yeah. you say, a less malignant yeah. uh, example. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's very, very indicative. But you won't get any of this through the persona as such uh, if you're distracted by it. Because as I say, the purpose of a persona is to distract and engage. Mm. It conceals, but it also engages and invites the other person to engage with that. So people don't give too much away about themselves, but they learn to get on. And that's a normal adaptive function. But the complexes will be active, will be embedded within the, the broader matrix of the persona, uh, and they will fire off at you in order to test whether you can see them, even if the sufferer themselves is not aware that it's happening. And this is the origin, for example, of the famous paraprax or Freudian slip, where uh, mm. it's, a, it's a fairly obvious example where that occurs, <coughs> mm. that somebody gives away something in the middle of what they say, or yeah. it might even be an action. Mm. And sometimes through humour, just to follow on from that, yeah. and, and Freud's work on that as well. Yeah, yeah, jokes in a jokes relationship. Jokes in a relationship to the, the unconscious, unconscious yeah. yeah. And, and it's, yeah. I think with something like that, uh, like humour, it's actually more difficult to tackle because, yeah. you know, people come back and just say, oh, it's just joking just about joke, that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right, and, and they're dismissive of it. But yeah. you do see a lot of things woven in through humour as well. You do. It can be a mild form of social aggression. Humor, yes. Uh, depending yeah. on how it's used. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's like, um, and I like the idea of being practical with this type of stuff as well. Mm. So like we've talked mm. about the personal myth a lot. I think every, I would encourage everyone, if you're interested in depth psychology, to do this to starting off, presumably because this is the environment you find yourself in, um, with your favourite YouTube personalities, I would say. Yeah. To be like, first of all, who am I drawn to? That will, that will give away a lot of what your, where your libido is going to. Yes. So your own complex is underneath that being potentially the mm. personal myth. But then to reverse engineer it off of other people to be like, okay, why are they in this position doing X, Y, Z? Because that also then separates yourself from them too. Because that was, I only speak about this type of thing because well, one, I felt it in myself and two, it's a hugely relevant thing with the people who sign up 
for a consultation, at least with myself and I mm. believe with you two as well. Yeah. Identification with those other people and thinking that someone might be wise or strong or on the right path when in fact it's just their personal myth underneath. But not even the personal myth, it's just the complex is clustered on top of it. Yeah. That would take your libido and be like, okay, you're doing this now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'd, I'd encourage every, everybody to do that. It's a safe exercise to do as well. It is. And it puts it all is. this stuff into practice. You're like, ah, this works. Yes. That's really cool. Yeah. And of course, all, yeah. not all complexes are negative either. No, no, they're not. No, not it's not important not so to, to remember, isn't it? They're not all pathological. No, no, they're not. They're just basically the functional units of mm. what Jung called the personal unconscious. Mm. So they, they make up uh, active parts of our memory rather than passive parts um, in the sense that it's usually dealt with memory, in, say in academic psychology and in neuroscience. Uh, it's a dynamic form of memory, a unit which has a degree of autonomy from our normal consciousness. Um, and it can move around literally and it can acquire new information, it can shed information, it can hook up with other experiences that we have. Um, and basically it's the stuff of psychodynamics complexes. Uh, that's what you have to deal with in everyday life. And one of the modern variants on that is the cognitive schema of CBT, um, which is uh, a paucity by comparison with uh, Jung's model. It does not address the body or emotions in anything like the same way. Um, and we've never found it useful. In fact, it just gets in the way and, mm. and diverts you away from real people and real experience. But enough of a rant about CBT. <laughs> I'll go off on one, you know, don't want to do that. Well, it's, it's like, um, it's why we call ourselves Jung to live by, because yeah. obviously we've, we've um, you know, critiqued the man of Jung and critiqued yeah. Jungian psychology a lot. Yeah. But if we're talking about complexes, that's the core of what we're doing. Mm. Yeah. I and mean, then the anima, the animus, or the relating yes. function. That's what you need at the core of the model, and you yeah. know everything else goes on top. But really, moment to moment, that's what you're working with. It is. It it's is. the stuff of everyday life, yeah. isn't it? Whether you're working with it clinically yeah. or it's just you know just something which happens in the context of your own life, and you don't particularly analyse it. They're, they're there all the time, operating, aren't they? Are. they at they are. various levels. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a relatively safe way again, <clears> to sort of begin working on yourself with some of those exercises. It's like, why am I doing what I'm doing? And the things that will be driving that will be, as you say, Pauline, neither mm. good nor bad. Yeah. But these little autonomous subroutines yes. that you yeah. go into pilot mode on. Yes. Yeah. If, yes. If, if you're a clinician, you do have to become forensic about it. You do. Mm. Um, because it's so easy, so easy to be tripped up by your own, uh, to be distracted by other people's, to be persuaded in a defensive way by <clears throat> a person's complexes that they haven't actually got them, that they're yes. not there. Uh, that can be an issue. Also, uh, on the basis of clinical empiricism, complexes act to defend themselves. All the basic Freudian defense mechanisms operate through complexes. Um, and surprisingly, they will excrete emotion in the same way that a skunk would excrete a bad smell to put you off uh, approaching them. This is if you're, if you're suffering from a particular complex, you may feel uh, fear or panic at the idea of approaching the idea. That is the oh, complex yeah. protecting itself. That's an index of its autonomy. There are ways of dealing with that uh, and you can deal with it very, very quickly. It doesn't have to take a, lo uh, a lot of time. But what you do have to do as a therapist is you have to assess what you're up against properly and keep that assessment alive and engaged moment by moment with the person you're working with. Mm, definitely. But sometimes that's the point at which people actually leave therapy. Once you actually start to, to challenge things. Mm. Um, oh, that's true, actually. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously you can't pursue people on that. It's their choice to, to end things. But if, if they can stay the course, that's usually a turning point. Yeah, yeah. Yes, if they can. If they can indeed. But they are they are tricky things to deal with. Oh, they are. Yes, yeah, they are. without they, a doubt. Like they, you say, they have an intelligence. They do. They, wherever you're capable of in terms yeah. of your intellect, they've got it. Mm. Um, and it's interesting that when Jung did his uh, research on into uh, parapsychology uh, with his uh, doctoral thesis on the psychology of so-called occult phenomenon, he found that mediums, even when they, or so-called mediums, even when they channeled a spirit, the spirit never exceeded the level of intelligence of the medium. Mm. And one of his indexes, if you like, or indices of whether a medium was genuine or not would have been whether they could have channeled a higher intelligence that was beyond the level of the medium's normal personality. Other than that, it suggests it's just a dissociation, a split within consciousness, and that complex 
that has been split off and acting autonomously still accesses the available level of intelligence uh, and memory, etc., that that normal person has. Mm. Can these things come in at a lower intelligence then? Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, it's a lot easier yeah. to drop down than it is to go up. Mm. Yeah. Far easier. I was going to say that kind of mimics a superiority complex behaviour if you're bringing yourself down in some capacity. Yes. You might yeah. be using that deliberately to trick you yeah. as well, that it's not there. Yeah, it's okay. complicated. Yeah. Isn't it? it really, it does become a forensic game. It does doesn't very it? much. It, it does. It does. But you can negotiate with them uh, because there is a higher level organising principle that is interested in optimal health in people, uh, and if you can access that, you can begin the process of depotentiating the complex mm. and then breaking it down. If you can separate it off from its emotion, then it will definitely weaken. And it's like the, the, the progressive stages of uh, long-term memory storage then where some it becomes progressively more and more abstract and further away from consciousness. Um, that's what happens with a, a complex once it's been robbed of its emotional charge. It just becomes part of the wallpaper, the background memory, and it mm. no longer elicits an emotional reaction or a psychosomatic reaction or a psychosocial response or behaviour. You literally just paper it into the wallpaper and it's just a memory without any emotional uh, loading at all. So that's the target. You don't have to do that though by abreacting someone, which is a, an intense release of emotion. Because the problem with that is it's a little bit like a kettle of water that's boiled. Once it's boiled away, then the kettle fills up again and you have to boil it away again. But if you can separate the complex from the kettle, metaphorically, and particularly from the libido in the form of the electricity which would warm it up, then it just falls away naturally. So separation of the emotion from the ideas, that's the most important thing if you can achieve that clinically when dealing with complexes. But sometimes you do have to go in and challenge the ideas themselves. That, that can happen. That can happen, yeah. Or yeah. create a counter complex. Yes, as well. that's another and, approach. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's you, another way yeah, of doing yeah. it, isn't it? Which is a yeah. kind of a almost a knight's move, really, by creating it is. It is. something else um, to not necessarily oppose it, but something where that person's libido can go in a positive direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that can help to weaken. You can actually you can see that happening too. actually through typology, which yes. is an interesting little topic all on its own whereby the psyche will actually produce the response that, that is necessary to deal with a complex by getting the person to express their inferior function. Mm. Um, that, that's a clinical observation and it's worth discussing at some point. Mm. So I guess you guys were saying that the best way clinically to deal with stuff like this would be hypnosis? Yeah. And the best way by yourself, if you're going to do it by yourself, the self-development stuff, I guess would be self-hypnosis then, in that case. Yes, if you do it properly, if you do it properly, self-hypnosis will give you all the information that you, all the skills that you need to build upon. It's so foundational. Um, and if anybody doubts that, they should read Henri Ellenberger's *The Discovery of the Unconscious*, which was published in 1970, which is an absolute landmark volume on the history of depth psychology. Mm. Thank you for watching this episode of *Young to Live By*. If you haven't already, make sure you download our free PDF for integrating your shadow. It includes the most advanced theory on the topic available anywhere on the internet, as well as a full practical breakdown. If you've ever wanted to integrate your shadow, this is honestly the way to do it. Thanks again for watching, and take care.